beta of our alpha 1 uh, for the biologic activity of our, our alpha 1 receptor. So, for example, when an agonist will bind to the alpha 1 receptor in the blood vessel, for example, this will cause the vasoconstriction. And uh, another is uh, when an agonist, for example, will bind to an alpha 1 receptor in the, in the pupil of the eye, it will cause mitriasis. For the alpha 2 receptors, so, so going back no, to our alpha 2 receptors, so saan nga ito siya makikita? So when we say alpha 2 receptors, they are usually located at the presynaptic uh, terminals. For the alpha 1 receptors, they are usually located at the postsynaptic nerve endings. So for the effect no, of our alpha 2 receptors, they are mainly inhibitory, meaning that uh, when an agonist will bind to the alpha 2 receptors in the presynaptic a neuron or the presynaptic nerve terminal, its effect will be inhibitory. So it will uh, inhibit the release of our um, neurotransmitters, particularly the norepinephrine, acetylcholine, as well as it will also you know, inhibit the release of another type of hormone, which is the insulin. For the beta-1, uh, receptor. So when our agonist will bind to the heart, to the beta-1 receptor that is located in the heart, it will uh, increase the heart rate, the stroke volume, and the blood pressure, uh, as well as the contractility of the heart. For the beta-2 receptors, so again, the beta-2 receptors are, they are mainly located in the lungs. Uh, so that when the agonist will bind to the beta-2 receptors in the bronchi, so this will induce um, bronchodilation. So in the liver, when the agonist will bind to the beta-2 receptors in the liver, so this will induce the breakdown of glycogen breakdown of glycogen or also known as uh, glycogenolysis. When the agonist will bind to the beta-2 receptors that is located in the pancreas, particularly the endocrine pancreas, so this will induce the release of glucagon. So we have here uh, the different types of new, uh, the different types of uh, mediators or neurotransmitters that are found you know, within the that are that mediates the sympathetic nervous system or the the action of the sympathetic nervous system so we have the ne norepinephrine and epinephrine so they are the two major types of hormone or neurotransmitters that are found in the sympathetic nervous system so although in our lecture or in the video earlier the epinephrine no, is considered to be a hormone and a neurotransmitter while a norepinephrine, based on the video, is uh, considered to be a neurotransmitter. So for the alpha-1 receptor, the norepinephrine is considered to be more potent than epinephrine in the alpha-1 receptor. So meaning that uh, when norepinephrine will, be, will bind to the alpha-1 receptor, so will, it will, uh, for example, induce more vasoconstriction as compared to epinephrine. So it is more potent. Uh, it is a more potent agonist of the alpha-1 receptor. For the alpha-2, you know, for the alpha-2 receptor, epinephrine is considered to be more potent agonist to the alpha-2 receptor. So meaning that it will activate uh, it is more potent in the activation of the alpha-2 receptor. So therefore, when, for example, uh, epinephrine will bind to the alpha-2 receptors that are located in the presynaptic terminal, it will uh, induce a more profound inhibition of the release of the norepinephrine, 
as well as acetylcholine. For the beta, beta 1 receptor, when we are go, going to compare the two, uh, the two agonists no, or the two ligands in the beta 1 receptor, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine are equal in terms of their potency. For the beta 2 receptors, so epinephrine is considered to be more potent uh, agonist in the beta 2 receptor. So some references says that epinephrine is 10 times more potent than norepinephrine in the beta 2 receptor. So for example, when epinephrine will bind to the beta 2 receptors that are located in the bronchi, epinephrine will induce a 10 times uh, more bronchodilation as compared to when norepinephrine will, will bind to the beta-2 receptors. So aside from, aside from the affinity or the potency of the, of this uh, catecholamines to the, to the different adrenergic receptors, so the other factor that will determine the, its effect you know, on the different tissues is of course the, the number of these receptors that are located in the different tissues. So for example, there are different tissues having more uh, beta-1 receptor compared to the beta-2 receptor or alpha receptors. So this uh, factor will also uh, influence you know, the, the effect of these catecholamines in different tissues. Again, now considering the, the alpha and the beta receptors, so we have here a uh, comparison of the potency of the different ticolamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine. So based on the figure, we can say that the alpha one or norepinephrine is more potent than epinephrine in the alpha receptor. While for the beta receptors, uh, epinephrine you know, is considered to be more potent in the activation of the beta receptors as compared to norepinephrine. So for its action on the smooth muscle, so they have opposing uh, actions or opposing effects. So for example, when epinephrine or norepinephrine will bind to the alpha receptors, particularly the alpha-1 receptor, so it will induce the contraction of the smooth muscle. For the beta receptors, so it is more on the opposite uh, side. Uh, beta receptors is more on the relaxation of the smooth muscle. So for example, when epinephrine, uh, for example, when epinephrine will bind to the beta-2 receptors that is located in the lungs, so it will uh, induce you know, the relaxation of the bronchi. So we also have here you know, another figure showing the effect of the catecholamines on vascular smooth muscle. So the two the, the two major uh, catecholamines in the sympathetic nervous system is being compared. So we have here the uh, epinephrine and the so the the affinity you no know, rather of the epinephrine is being compared as to uh, the presence of the different uh, receptors or other energetic receptors in the uh, smooth muscle. So for example, in this figure, uh, the blue one here, you know, the blue one here represents the beta 2 receptor and the pink one represents the alpha 1 receptors. So there are certain organs no, such as, or certain tissues such as a smooth muscle, wherein both of these receptors are present in the tissue. 
So we have beta-2 receptors in the smooth muscle and alpha-1 receptor in the uh, smooth muscle. But take note that uh, these two receptors has opposing effects. So the beta-2 receptors will induce the smooth muscle relaxation while the alpha-1 receptors will induce smooth muscle contraction. So the, the end point of this or the predominant effect you know, will vary according to the potency of that particular um, catecholamine or the potency of the catecholamine or epinephrine to that particular receptor and also the number of receptors you know, that are present in that particular tissue. So in this particular example on the left, so at low epinephrine concentrations, the beta-2 AR adreno, uh, adrenergic receptor will be occupied because these receptors have higher affinity for epinephrine. So in this case, when there is a low uh, epinephrine concentration in the blood, so the receptors that where epinephrine will be bound will be the beta-2 receptors because again, now when we are going to compare the affinity of our uh, epinephrine to the beta receptors as compared to the alpha receptor, so we can we can uh, we can observe or we can see from this figure that epinephrine is more potent or it has more affinity to the beta receptors as compared to the alpha receptors. So that you now when the when there is a low level of epinephrine in the blood, the receptors where epinephrine will bind will be the beta 2 receptors because it has more affinity or it is more potent to that particular receptor. So in this uh, case, there will be a relaxation of the smooth muscles because again, you know, the biologic activity of the beta-2 receptor would be the relaxation of the smooth muscles. So how about when there is a high level of epinephrine that is present in the plasma? So what will happen is the alpha-1 receptors will be occupied. This is because there are more alpha-1 receptors, uh, there are more of these receptors, you know, the predominant effect at high epinephrine concentration is vascular smooth muscle contraction. So basically, you know, in the smooth muscles, uh, when we are going to uh, compare the number of alpha-1 receptors as compared to the beta-2 receptors. So the predominant receptors are the alpha-1 receptors. So in this case, there are more alpha-1 receptors. So meron 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 13. You now 13 receptors that are present in the smooth muscle and ano lang, no? lima lang yung ating beta-2 receptors. So therefore, pag ma-occupy na yung lahat ng receptors, the effect will, would uh, now depend on the number of receptors or the percent occupancy of the receptors. So kung ano yung mas maraming receptors, so yun yung mag-predominate na effect. So since the, the biologic activity of the alpha-1 receptor is to induce smooth muscle contraction, so since more uh, epinephrine was able to was able to bind you know, to the alpha one receptor, so it's a begin, yung effect ng alpha one receptor will predominate. So kahit na yung epinephrine mas it tends no it, it, it has more affinity to the beta two receptors, but uh, when but because no, yung ating alpha-1 receptors, it has more number, it is more numerous as compared to the beta-2 receptors in the smooth muscle. So yung ating effect ng ating alpha-1 receptors will predominate in this case. So in this case, there will be the contraction of the smooth muscles. 
So trick to remember the receptor affinity. So for the alpha receptors, so again, for the alpha receptors, no, the norepinephrine has a higher affinity. So no E. Norepinephrine, so no E in alpha. Higher affinity for norepinephrine. For the beta receptor, so beta has an E. Epinephrine, then E. And so that is one of the tricks for you to remember the receptor affinity. So the epinephrine has a higher affinity for the beta, beta receptor as compared to norepinephrine. And uh, for the alpha receptor, the most dominant or the most potent catecholamine is the norepinephrine. So we have here the effects no, of uh, sympathetic innervation to the different uh, tissues, no, such as this, the smooth muscle, the pyloric sphincter, the urinary sphincter, and the pupil. So when, when the agonist or when the for example, epinephrine will bind to the alpha-1 receptor, so it will induce the contraction of the smooth muscle, a contraction of the pyloric sphincter, the contraction of the urinary sphincter, and pupillary dilation. So itong pupillary dilation, this is also known as mitriasis. So contraction of the urinary sphincter will result to a decrease in the urination, Contraction in the pyloric sphincter will uh, inhibit digestion and inhibit peristalsis. And the vasoconstriction will lead to increase you know, in the blood pressure. Uh, we also have here you know, the action of the alpha receptors in the, uh, particularly you know, the alpha 2 receptors. So the, again, the alpha 2 receptors is mainly inhibitory. It has an uh, inhibitory action, meaning that uh, when our catecholamine will bind to our alpha-2 receptor, so it will decrease or it will inhibit the release of our catecholamines from the presynaptic nerve uh, ending. So norepinephrine, for, for example, in this case we have norepinephrine, it will bind to the alpha-2 receptors. So the alpha-2 receptors in this case now are located uh, in here. You know, we have the postganglionic sympathetic neuron, uh, the alpha-2 receptors. So when uh, this uh, red one here, our norepinephrine, will be released, now some of this norepinephrine will bind, you know, will bind to the alpha-2 receptor that is located at the post-ganglionic uh, sympathetic neuron. And when this uh, norepinephrine will bind to the adrenergic receptor, so it will inhibit the further release of this uh, norepinephrine from the post-ganglionic neuron. So this uh, type of example, you know, the binding of the norepinephrine to our alpha-2 adrenergic receptor is a form of negative feedback because its binding will inhibit further you know, the release of the neurotransmitters from our post-ganglionic neuron. So simplifying the receptors, so alpha-1, uh, it, it mediates the contraction of the smooth muscle for alpha-2. It is inhibitory in nature, will inhibit you know, the release of the our catecholamines from the presynaptic nerve. For the beta-1 receptor, so it, um, it is mainly located in the heart and the kidney. So in the heart, it will increase the heart rate. And in the kidney, it will increase the uh, release of renin. So from our previous uh, discussion, renin is important in the RAS system, you know, in the renin uh, angiotensin aldosterone system in order to regulate or in order to maintain the blood pressure into normal.
or in order to increase the blood pressure. For the beta-2 receptors, again, they are mainly located in the bronchi, so it will induce relaxation. In the liver, it will uh, stimulate the release of glucose from glycogen. Uh, the same is true for the for the eyes. Now it will induce the midriasis. For the beta-3 receptors, uh, these are mainly found on the uh, adipose tissue. So again, now this is the action of our the effect of our beta receptors of binding of our epinephrine or norepinephrine to the beta-2 receptors, or beta-1 receptors rather. So the beta-1 receptors are predominantly found in the, the heart. So basically, yung ating uh, epinephrine or norepinephrine will bind to the beta-1 receptors that are located on the sur surface of the cell. And it will, uh, after binding, it will increase no, yung ating stroke volume. It will increase the heart rate. And it uh, ultimately, it will increase the cardiac output. So when the cardiac output will be, really, will be increased, there are more blood that is being pumped by the heart. So this will, in, will increase also the BP or the blood pressure. In the kidney, um, the binding of the epinephrine, for example, in the beta-1 receptor in the kidney will induce the release of renin from the nephron or particularly you know, from the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So the renin will be released and this renin will participate in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And ultimately, the RAS will be important also to increase the blood pressure. So for the beta-2 receptors, so they are again mainly found on the bronchi, so they will induce bronchodilation. In the gut, it will decrease peristalsis. Of course, during fight or flight, peristalsis will be inhibited. In the liver, you know, it will induce the gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis to promote the release of glucose. So when we say a gluconeogenesis, that, that is the formation of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources such as lactate no, and pyruvate. For the uh, smooth muscle, no, it will induce a vasodilation or a relaxation that is opposite of that of the alpha-1 receptor. For bladder so when the uh, the agonist will bind to the to this one no, to the pyloric sphincter of the bladder so it will induce the relaxation so urination we also have the beta receptors that are found on the adipose tissue so the responses of target tissues to catecholamines so for the liver so the predominant uh, receptors or adrenoreceptors that are found in the liver is beta-2. So in the, when the catecholamines will bind to beta-2 receptors, so it will induce glycogenolysis, lipolysis, and the gluconeogenesis. For the adipose tissue, are the same, and are the same for the uh, skeletal muscle. So in the pancreas, we also have uh, the presence of the alpha-2 and the beta-2 receptors. So as we all know, the alpha-2 receptor is an uh, inhibitory, you know, inhibitory type of receptor. So that when the catecholamine will bind to the alpha-2 receptor, it will decrease the secretion of insulin. When the uh, catecholamine will bind to the beta-2 receptor, it will increase. So the, the opposite will be uh, the opposite, you know, which is increase in insulin secretion. But for the parasympathetic uh, for the cardiovascular system for the cardiovascular system, you know, the 
predominant uh, receptor in the heart is the beta 1. So mainly there will be increased in all the parameters of the heart, now, such as the heart rate and the contractility. For the alpha 2 receptors, so they, they are mainly found in the blood vessels, so they, this will induce vasoconstriction. And for the lungs, now the, it will induce now the vasodilation. Uh, So lungs, bronchial muscle, it will induce relaxation, GIT. It will uh, decrease the contractility you know, of the GIT. And for the urinary bladder, uh, uh, alpha-2, when, for example, catecholamine will bind to the alpha-2, the sphincter will be contracted, so urination will be inhibited. So, of course, in the sympathetic uh, response or the fight-or-flight response, the predominant response will be that of the alpha-2 because uh, during a fight-or-flight response, no urination is uh, disinhibited. The same is true for the GIP you know, during the fight-or-flight response, so there will be decrease in the digestion or peristalsis. So there, these are the factors that simulate the secretion of catecholamines from the adrenal medulla. So the, the main physiological factor you know, that would influence the catecholamine secretion you know, from the medulla is the adrenal medulla is hypoglycemia or the low blood sugar level. So in this situation, epinephrine secretion is stimulated by decreases in the blood glucose concentration that are within normal physiological limits. So another uh, stimuli for the release of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla is the decrease in the blood pressure. So catecholamines are important for the maintenance of blood pressure in conjunction with severe blood loss. So aside from hypovolemia, you know, the other major uh, stimuli or factor that will induce the secretion of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla is the decrease in the blood pressure. Another is decrease in temperature. This is another factor that will increase epinephrine secretion. Uh, catecholamines are important for the adaptation to cold exposure in terms of heat, uh, increased heat production. So one of the abnormalities or the diseases that are found in the adrenal medulla is the phaeochromocytoma. So this was presented by uh, Windy Blount you know, in one of the, uh, the uh, this was adapted from Windy Blount. So phaeochromocytoma is an uncommon tumor of the chromophene cells in the adrenal medulla. So again, the chromophene cells are the one you know, responsible for the storage of our catecholamines in the uh, adrenal medulla. So they are the source you know, of the catecholamines from the adrenal medulla. So occasionally it can arise from the chromophene cells you know, outside the adrenal gland. So the right adrenal uh, gland is considered to be more uh, common, uh, commonly affected than the left. And uh, most of the cases of phaeochromocytoma are malignant in nature and functional. So basically, you know, the, the main function of these chromophene cells or the adrenal medulla you know, is the production of this uh, atecholamines, epinephrine or epinephrine and dopamine. So for the Characteristic of this particular disease, so 40% have metastasized at the time of diagnosis. So metastasis can occur in the lymph nodes or the regional lymph nodes, the liver, the lungs, the bone, and the sinus. So when there is metastasis of the tumors you know, from the adrenal medulla, so it can be said, it can be concluded that this particular 
uh, incidence or the, this particular disease is already malignant or cancerous in nature. So many, uh, many of these tumors will also invade the codelta and akaka. So for the clinical signs, 60% is diagnosed on necropsy and the symptoms can be nonspecific and episodic. So malignant hypertension is considered to be the hallmark uh, clinical manifestation in 95% of the cases. So when we say malignant hypertension, so that is uh, a condition that is produced by the phagochromocytoma wherein there is a very high blood pressure you know, that uh, comes on suddenly and weakly. There are different types of hypertension and one of that is malignant hypertension. So there is also sustained hypertension with severe episodes, 50% of the cases. There is also a normotensive episode. So when we say normotensive episode, that is a condition wherein the blood pressure is within the normal limit. There is also a stable hypertension in 25% of the cases. And uh, normotension does not rule out that there is no uh, phaeochromocytoma. For the systolic blood pressure, it can reach as high as uh, more than 300 millimeters of mercury or mmHg. The normal uh, blood pressure in dogs is in the range of 110 over 60 to 160 over 90. So the one at the, the upper upper part, no, the for example, 110 over 60, yung sa taas is the systolic. Yung sa baba naman ay diastolic. So when there is a systolic blood pressure that is more than 300, so it can indicate no, um, hypertension in dogs. There is also tachyarrhythmia, panting, nervousness, exercise intolerance, weakness, and collapse. So there is hypertension basically because epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are produced by the adrenal medulla, particularly the chromaffin cells, are important you know, in order to increase the blood pressure. So, for example, when epinephrine will bind to the beta-1 receptor in the heart, you know, it will induce the increase in the heart rate, increase in the cardiac output, and increase in the blood pressure. So there is also a bleeding diathesis. So when we say bleeding diathesis, you know, that is the tendency to bleed or bruise easily. There is also hyphema. Hyphema is the presence of blood within the anterior chamber of the eye. And there is also bleeding from the gums and CNS bleeding. So the bleeding may be due to the activation of its effects on the blood vessels. There is also an abdominal mass, the presence of mass that is palpable and there is abdominal discomfort, abdominal effusion, and caudal peripheral edema. There is also the presence of tumor uh, thrombus in the caudal vena cava, ascites, and caudal peripheral edema. So when there is hypertension, the animal would also be prone no, to the development of edema and ascites. There is also PUPD in 29% of the cases. What do we mean by PUPD? Ano yung ibig sabihin ng ating ano, PUPD? Polyuria and polydipsia, Doc. Okay. So there is uh, increased urination and increase in the thirst. Fever, anorexia, and vomiting, diarrhea, and constipation. So these are the lab works. No, CBC is non-specific. 
uh, when conducting serology, it is also non-specific. There is an increase in the liver enzymes, which can mimic hyperadrenocorticism. Uh, in the urinalysis, there is um, and specific uh, clinical signs such as proteinuria and poorly concentrated urine. So these are the cytologic findings for uh, pheochromocytoma. So FNA refers to fine needle aspiration. So this is done you know, in, or in order to identify the, the nature of that particular this, uh, metastasis, you know, whether it is already uh, how systemic or how uh, invasive is that particular metastasis. FNA or fine anidal aspiration. So any adrenal tumor has the propensity to bleed. You know, that is why uh, one of the clinical findings of pheochromocytoma is the increase in uh, bleeding or uh, diathesis. Catecholamine storm is possible with pheochromocytoma. So when we say catecholamine storm, that is a condition where in there is an excessive release of catecholamines from the tumor or the pheochromocytoma tumor, uh, catecholamine storm. So these are the histologic findings of the uh, adrenal medulla with pheochromocytoma. Now fine chromatin in with incons uh, inconsistent nucleoli present. Uh, we also have the plasma-free methanephrin. So, so uh, can measure plasma-free methanephrin or fractionated urine methanephrin. So when we say methanephrin, now that is the uh, breakdown, the product of the breakdown of the catecholamines. So when there is an increase in the level of the free methanephrine, it can indicate that there is an uh, increase also in the production of catecholamines from the pheochromocytoma tumor. So phenoxybenzamine, corticosteroids, and tricyclic antidepressants can falsely increase you know, the level of methanephrine that is present in the plasma. So when, when we say um, phenoxybenzamine, you know, that is a drug that is uh, used as an antagonist to the alpha adrenergic receptor. For the treatment, adrenalectomy is considered to be the treatment of choice and uh, perioperative mortality is between 50%. Retreatment with phenoxybenzamine for 20 days reduces the mortality. So it's also important not to treat the hypertension. And if they survive, surgery means survival for one year. That is the Pheochromocytoma, you know, the, the one of the most important abnormality or uh, malignant no, abnormality that is present in the adrenal, adrenal medulla. So any questions for our adrenal medulla? None so far, Pudo. So our next topic is all about pancreas. So I'm going uh, mute. So our next topic now is uh, about the pancreas. So we'll just have to have an introductory you know, sa pancreas. So pancreas. For the anatomy of the pancreas, so again, they are located 
uh, the pancreas is made you know, of the right and left lobe, which join to form a small central body. So in terms of their location, the right lobe is uh, closely associated with the uh, proximal duodenum, while the left lobe is uh, usually associated with the stomach, and particularly the greater curvature of the stomach and the pylorus. So this is the illustration in our anatomy of the pancreas. Uh, we also have here you know, another schematic drawing of the pancreas and the associated landmarks. So the pancreatic body is represented by the letter B. Ito yung ating pancreatic body. We also have the right lobe. So the right lobe is uh, associated with the duodenum. The left lobe is uh, associated with the stomach. So the pancreas consists of lobules of glandular tissue surrounded by fine connective tissue. So the basic unit of the pancreas is the lobules. It has exocrine and endocrine components. So the pancreas is one of the endocrine, uh, endocrine glands or one of the glands in the body or one of the, the organs in the body that has both an exocrine and an endocrine function. 98% of the total mass of the uh, pancreas is exocrine, the exocrine portion. So the lobules are composed of acinar cells, which are responsible for synthesizing the digestive enzymes. So this is the exocrine function of our pancreas. Now that is the production of digestive enzymes that are released through uh, the the ducts, you know, the ducts that are present in the the pancreas, not to be released, for example, in the in the duodenum or the small intestine for digestion of the the bolus. So let's now focus on the endocrine pancreas. So this is composed of the islands of polygonal cells, which, which are known as the islets of Langerhans. So these islets of Langerhans form anastomosing cords, and they are intimately associated with the acinar cells. So again, the acinar cells you know, are those cells that are uh, mainly of exocrine function. There are four distinct cell types of the islets of Langerhans. We have the alpha cells the beta cells, the delta cells, and the PP cells, or the F cells. So the alpha cells is mainly responsible for the production of glucagon. The beta cells is the one you know, that is uh, responsible for the insulin production. The delta cells will produce somatostatin. And the F cells will produce the pancreatic polypeptide. So this is our uh, the, the, the illustration of a pancreas no, showing the, the acinar cells, which are important for its exocrine function. And a small portion of the pancreas is uh, occupied by the pancreatic islets. So the pancreatic islets is composed of different cells, such as alpha and beta cells. We also have here the schematic diagram of the pancreatic lobule showing the intimate relationship of the acinar cells. Now, this blue one here are the acinar cells or the acini. Uh, with islet cells, islet cells which has an uh, endocrine uh, function. So the blue one here represents the acini. And uh, we have here you know, the they are separated by uh, connective tissue. And they form you know, into lobules. We also have here the uh, histologic section in HE stain of the acini of the exocrine pancreas stain, exocrine pancreas, and the 
endocrine pancreas. So we have here the presence of the eyelids no, of longer hands. And we also have here the majority of the pancreas in the histologic section is occupied by the pancreatic acini, which is the exocrine pancreas. So in between the this acini are the, the ducts, you know, the interlobular ducts and the blood vessels. We also have here you know, another section of the pancreas, the histologic section of the pancreas, showing the eyelets of longer hands, which you know, in this particular histologic section is pale staining as compared to the more uh, darker staining exocrine tissue or the uh, acinar cells. We also have here you know, another depiction of the islet of lung rats, islets of lung rats in the pancreas of the rats. So this is the depiction of the pancreatic islet showing the different cells of the pan uh, pancreatic islets of lung rats. So we have the alpha cells the, this uh, bluish one here are the alpha cells, the beta cells, no? the, the delta cells, and the polypeptide uh, F, PP cells or the F cells. So the, the main portion or the main portion of the pancreas or the endocrine pancreas that is mainly responsible for the production of pancreatic hormones is the islet of Langerhans. The islet of Langerhans was derived from the name you know, of a medical student known as Paul Langerhans. And he was uh, studying you know, the structure of the pancreas under the microscope when he noticed tissue clumps scattered throughout the pancreas. He named them as the islets of Langerhans. So then the name no islets of Langerhans was derived no, from this uh, student or this person. So the endocrine pancreas is responsible now for the production of one of the most important hormone in the body, which is the insulin. So for the history of insulin, Uh, Oscar Min Minkowski, which is a Polish-German physician, together with uh, another a scientist, John uh, Joseph von Mering, was uh, credited, credited you know, to, to be the first person to be able to discover the hormone insulin you know, from the pancreas. So they used uh, dogs as the, their testing animal in order to, 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 to ascertain the presence of this particular hormone. So they removed the pancreas of the dog, of the healthy dog, to test its assumed role in the digestion. So on testing the urine, they found sugar in the dog's urine establishing the first time a relationship between the pancreas and diabetes. So they are the first uh, persons or scientists that is credited in the discovery of the link between the pancreas and the presence of the hormone insulin. We also have here you know, the other persons or the other scientists that are uh, important in the discovery of the insulin as well as in the treatment of the condition you know, the diabetes mellitus. So the these four persons that were credited you know, in the discovery of insulin are uh, Frederick Bunting, no Charles Best, John McLeod, and James Collett. So they will, they are uh, 
they collaborated in order to approve you know, the presence of uh, insulin and that they also proved that insulin can be used to treat diabetes mellitus. So in this, uh, for example, in, in this particular diagram, no, John MacLeod was able to isolate and purify insulin and uh, James Collip is the one responsible for isolating and also purifying insulin. So they use uh, dogs, healthy dogs, in order to uh, prove the link you know, between increase in the blood, increase in the sugar in the urine, and the role of the pancreas in the maintenance you know, of the blood sugar. So dogs were used as experimental subjects in the insulin test. So we'll continue this no next meeting. We will uh, start first now with the history of the insulin, then we will uh, also tackle the First, now the function of the insulin as well as its uh, mechanism of action. So we'll uh, see you in our next meeting. Salamat po, Doc. Thank you. Salamat, sir. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc.